introduce you to our first speaker for today, uh, Jana von Grunsveren. Uh, she's an assistant professor in ethics and philosophy at the Technical University of Delft. She received her PhD in philosophy from the New School for Social Research in New York in 2015. And after that, she worked there as a postdoctoral teaching fellow. Broadly, her work focuses on experiences related to human embodiment and social interaction and the ways in which these can be shaped and transformed through the use of different technology. These can be clinical technologies. She has written in particular on how different theoretical pictures and technological developments have decisive ethical implications for how persons on the autism spectrum are brought into view in a moral sense. Also, neurodiversity and mental well being in general are topics she's interested in. So, Jana, you can go ahead. Great, thank you so much, Lainey. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, great. I just realized this is my first uh, COVID era uh, talk, and I'm, I'm not used to just, I'm, I'm talking to my screen right now, which I'm not really used to yet, but I'm glad to hear it's all okay. Um, so, yes, I, I wanted to start um, by thanking Jo and Els, uh, Christine and the Neuroepigenetics Research Group for giving me the opportunity to present some of my research to this really exciting, very relevant, um, knowledgeable audience. Um, as you are aware, the topic today is philosophical perspectives on neurodiversity. Um, and the way in which I've been thinking about neurodiversity is shaped by two aspects of my um, academic persona, if you will. Um, so my background is in, in 4E cognition. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Um, and as a member of the Ethics and Philosophy of Technology section at TU Delft, um, I have more recently um, started to focus on, on um, AAC technology or augmentative and alternative communication technologies and how these technologies are challenging and transferring our understanding of what autism is and, and um, what it means to be a speaker, to be non-speaking. Um, and one of the things I've been interested in um, is the degree to which AAC technologies um, can both promote and undermine empathic relationships between autistic persons and neurotypicals. And this is something um, that is also a, a four-year research project is focused on this question that will be conducted by um, my PhD student, Carolina Bulla, who I believe is also participating in this event. So in the presentation today, I'm going to focus on what I think 4E cognition can show us about what neurodiversity is. Um, but if there is some time to discuss AAC tech, I um, would be really excited to do so, but we will see. Um, let's see, before I delve into the specifics, I think there are three caveats that I want to make. Um, so as Yo already mentioned in his introduction, right, he, he himself is working on Tourette's. Um, I'm only focused on autism in this presentation and, and in fact um, that's the extent of my, um, my expertise when it comes to the neurodiversity. So my claims will be somewhat restricted. I'm not making general claims about neurodiversity. Um, there's also something problematic about speaking about autistic mindedness as a sort of general category, I think, um, but still I'm going to be using this term here and there. And there's also, I think, um, a problem potentially um, about speaking for autistic persons as a neurotypical, I would consider myself a neurotypical. I don't have a full-fledged view on, on what this means and to what extent I am in the position to speak on and for autistic persons, and this would certainly be something that I would welcome feedback on. So I think most people attending today's um, research day have some 
understanding of what neurodiversity means, but still in order to all be talking about the same thing, it's helpful to start with some definitions. And here I'm following the characterization or definition offered by Jamie Anderson. She's a philosopher and a mother of an autistic son who's done some nice work on, on autism. And so this is how she divine, defines neurodiversity. She says it means regarding autistic individuals as full persons rather than as broken beings in need of repair. And that it also means that rather than regarding autistic neurological structures as defective or disordered, one should regard autistic neurology as worth valuing because each neurological structure contributes to the collective variety of human neurological diversity in much the same way that each human culture contributes to cultural diversity. And I, I take it that when Anderson is using the term neurology here, it's sort of a stand-in term for human experience as such. Um, both Anderson herself and people working in the neurodiversity space are not just interested in neurological structures, but in, in experience, reasons for action, um, mindedness more broadly. So one of the things that stands out here probably is that Anderson is quite emphatic about the fact that neither, that autistic persons should not be considered as broken beings, that there's something problematic about using the term deficiency in thinking about autism. So what I wanna propose is that, so when we are talking about deficiency in the autism context, typically what is foregrounded is the idea that there are deficits in the area of social cognition. Um, and social cognition can broadly be understood as our ability to see and interact with other persons as minded beings who have their own beliefs, concerns, desires, intentions, etc., and who occupy their own rich lived perspective onto a shared world. And so, so the idea is that in some shape or form and in some way that needs to be explained, persons on the autism spectrum are deficient in this regard in, in, in the ability to um, engage in social cognition. Now, in one sense, I think if you look at some of the testimonials offered by persons on the autism spectrum in recent years or even decades, there is a kind of truism to this insight. Um, probably bringing in someone who will show up in nearly every <laughs> philosophical presentation on autism, but let's, let's look at something Temple Grandin um, has said about her own experience growing up as a child. So she says, something was going on between the other kids, something swift, subtle, constantly changing, an exchange of meanings and negotiation, a swiftness of understanding so remarkable that sometimes she, it's, written in the third person because it's um, Oliver Sacks recounting this from his encounters with Grandin, that, so that Grandin wondered if they were all telepathic. She's now aware that the, of the existence of these social signals, but she can infer them and cannot perceive them, cannot participate in this magical communication directly. This is why she often feels excluded, an alien. So there, there is at least something presumably right that there are genuine challenges in the area of social cognition for persons on the autism spectrum. So that could motivate one to think that there is some role to play for the notion of deficiency. But at the same time, of course, when you look at the same right overwhelming scala of testimonials from persons on the autism spectrum, you get a very different picture, right? So here I'm, I'm, I mean, you can, you can literally turn to, to any testimonial probably, but I happen to have picked this one by Gordy Baileyson and a young man who wrote a letter to try and help improve the notoriously problematic relationship between non-speaking autistic persons and law enforcement. So he writes, this letter is not a cry for pity. Pity is not what I'm looking for. I love myself just the way I am. This letter is, however, a cry for attention, recognition, and acceptance. 
With your attention, I can help you recognize the signs of non-speaking autism. If you can recognize the signs, then you will be able to recognize our differences, which then leads to understanding of those differences, which brings us to wonders of acceptance. So clearly, right, there is a, a resistance to the idea that persons on the autism spectrum are, right, uh, that they warrant the label of deficiency, that they are to be pitied or deemed as less than. So we have these, these two intuitions, if you will, that require balancing. So I, 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 I want to propose that a challenge, if not the challenge in theorizing neurodiversity, um, is that we have to acknowledge that there is something right about the idea that there, there are genuine challenges that we need to theorize. Um, and, and, and so the question that pops up is, what role does the notion of deficiency play in theorizing that? Um, if we want to hold on to this notion, then where should we locate it? Um, because what we don't want to do in taking seriously neurodiversity, or so I would say, is to locate the notion of deficiency wholly on the side of the autistic individual, right? This, this flies against the face of, of these countless testimonials at the same time. So I will call this the diversity deficiency challenge. How can we make room for both of these intuitions and, and where then should we locate deficiency? Now the standard way in which deficiency has been linked as a notion to persons on the autism spectrum, as many of you here probably know, is via the um, theory of mind deficiency view of autism. Um, and this view we can quickly, I, I don't wanna dwell on it, but we can quickly bring it in view by um, looking at what the, the positive theory of mind view of social cognition entails. So according to the theory of mind approach to social cognition, human beings make sense of each other and it's really the fact that we can even make sense of each other is maybe a better way to put it is quite magical because minds the assumption is minds are hidden closed off spheres populated with uh, mental states such as beliefs and desires and what we see when we see other people is we see outward physical behavior that is somehow in some sense linked to these inner states, but because we can't see these states, right? We, we, we need some way to, to enter into, right? That's why I put the bridge there in the image, right? We, we need some kind of bridge that gets us from this outward behavior to the inner mental states that people's minds consist of. And so the, there are lots of proposals on, on what this mechanism, this bridging mechanism looks like, um, typically, the idea is that we rely on either simulation mechanisms or theory building mechanisms um, that get us into the minds of others. And there's lots of disagreement about, you know, are these mechanisms subpersonal? Are they personal? Is there, do we need some kind of hybrid model? Um, I'm not going to go into that because I think the view is wrong as a whole. <laughs> Um, but this is sort of the standard view that this is how social cognition works. And if this is how social cognition works, then the Tom deficit view, the theory of mind deficit view of autism believes that autistic persons either lack or have a stunted theory of mind mechanism and that as such, they, they have difficulty with or, or cannot make sense of, of the physical behavior of others as um, expressive of uh, mindedness. So if what we want to do with our theorizing of autistic mindedness is uh, make sense of the diversity deficiency challenge that I mentioned earlier, the theory of mind deficit view of autism doesn't seem like the right candidate because it builds deficiency into its theory. And as Victoria McGeer has really nicely pointed out, it also discredits the testimonial evidence 
of autistic persons that they very much have a rich conception of other people as psychologically thick and of their own experiential lives as rich and so the idea is that um, from a theory of mind deficit perspective, these testimonials are sort of discredited offhand. So this is not where we can turn to in order to make sense of the diversity deficiency challenge. And what I was curious about with my background in 4E cognition is to what degree can 4E cognition make sense of this? So for those of you who are unfamiliar with 4E cognition, the four E's stand for the idea that minds are embodied, that they are embedded in, in social cultural contexts, that they are extended, right? that objects and, and infrastructures in our environment can extend and support our cognitive processes, and they are inactive. Um, so experience is something not something static, but something that um, that we acquire through our dynamic interactions with our environment. Now, 4E cognition thinkers have um, developed different theories of autism in recent years. We can identify the interactionism of Sean Gallagher, the autopoietic inactivism of um, Hannah de Jager, and the extended mind view that has been developed recently by Michelle Maez and Joel Kruger. And although each of these 4E approaches to autism have lots of stuff in common, um, for instance, the rejection of the theory of mind deficit view, what I was struck by when I started looking into them a little bit more is that, so they, they, they share a lot as this nice little picture of three people holding hands suggests, but they, they adopt slightly different starting points and points of emphases that ultimately really have quite radical effects on how autistic mindedness and the idea of neurodiversity and a notion of deficiency, how these are brought in view. So in, in a way, I'm, you know, my, my work in, in the, um, in the paper I just published in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. Um, you know, in a way, it's, it's sort of just trying to rehash what, what are these three different 4E theories saying about autism and neurodiversity and deficiency. And I guess the underlying point or why I think it matters that we look at these different theories quite carefully is because of the how subtle differences in theoretical emphasis and assumption and starting point can have such a, a profound effect in terms of how the minds of, of people are brought in view. So I'm going to spend most of the remainder of my talk going over to Gallagher's um, interactionist approach, and then I'll touch on the ways in which uh, the Jager's autopoietic inactive approach and Maez and Kruger's extended mind approach diverge from Gallagher's interactionism. So for Gallagher, sort of his starting point is rejecting the theory of mind deficiency view of autism. Um, and he's, he's arguing it, it, it fails as an account of autism because the theory of mind view fails as an account of tif typically developed social cognition. And, and his main point is that social cognition is not a matter of observing outward psychologically neutral behavior and then on the basis of inferential or simulatory mechanisms predict their behavior um, social cognition is a direct perceptual interactive endeavor. We, we, we typically make sense of the minds of others in shared pragmatic contexts in which relevance is already contextually shaped and we have an attitude towards the other from the standpoint of interaction. Now, really crudely put, um, what Gallagher is interested in is 
he wants to make sense of how it is possible that we typically, and the word typically is, is telling here already, but how we, we typically, according to him, directly see mindedness expressed in the bodily behavior of others. And, and his story is, is roughly the following. He gives what I consider a multi-layered account of social cognition. He believes that early on in infancy, um, the way in which human beings already perceive other minds as other minds is enabled by um, and, and scaffolded through dyadic, so interpersonal interaction um, that is both enabled by sensory motor skills that allows infants to experience the difference between their own bodies and the bodies of others. And it is also through those interactions that their sensory motor skills are further developed such that at around nine months old, infants enter into a phase called secondary intersubjectivity where they move from attending to the expressive bodies of, of their caretakers to attending to a third term with their caretakers. So a, a ball, for instance, or right, the kitty cat that's walking around in the living room. And through these scenes of shared attention, right, a wider world gets scaffolded where the child gets initiated into this is what we do with soccer balls, this is what we do with kitty cats, etc. And then this then further initiates people into narrative practices, practices in which we tell stories about ourselves and others, but also mental institutions such as universities or legal systems, ways in which the world that we share together get enriched and within which the, the behavior of others makes direct perceptual sense to us most of the time. So what, what Gallagher, he's not saying it exactly in this way, but what I'm taking him to say is that social cognition comes in degrees and that depending on how this trajectory that we saw here in his multi-layered account, depending on how the development that sort of walks a child from primary to secondary to the third layer, if you will, um, of social cognition, depending on how that developmental trajectory goes, somebody can be more or less integrated into this shared world in which we make sense of each other's behavior as expressive of their mindedness. And so you might have sufficient, if you will, sensory motor skills and, and um, yeah, effective skills to understand that someone is smiling without fully seeing the specificity of what that smile means. And so in, 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 in my paper, I use the example of, of people being in an office meeting together and somebody blundering through that office meeting and quickly seeing a smile of solidarity in a coworker and the kind of rich shared context you need to inhabit in order to immediately perceive that kind of smile. That's the kind of thing that Gallagher's account quite nicely explains how that, how that works for most people most of the time. But the important thing to note is Gallagher starts his account with a phenomenological observation. He's, he's really committed to that being his, the starting point for his analysis. And so what you see is this is his, so re really how he invites you into his, his theory. He's, he's trying to convince us that as agents, we do not stand to decide as third person observers. We engage in second person interactions. We do not try to get into the other person's mind, which is what the theory of mind account believes. We try to get into their world or more precisely into a world that we already share with them. This does not rule out the possibility that in rare cases we do take a theoretical stance, but these are the rare cases ordinarily in our everyday encounters in the pragmatic and social contexts that characterize our lives, we gain a perceptual grasp of another's 
contextualize actions, gestures, and expressions. And we understand their speech acts as meaningful and intentional without looking beyond such meanings to their mental states. So there's a lot of we talk here <laughs> that I, I always kind of accepted early in what I've been working on for e-cognition for so long, much, much longer than I started to, to work on, on notions of neurodiversity. And before doing so, this never bothered me, but once I started to think about the different ways in which people can experience the world, this just, this started to sound just wrong, <laughs> um, right? So who is this we? Um, and the, th the thing that stood out to me as well in reading Gallagher's account is that the we talk kind of stops when he transitions to his character characterizations of the sensory motor skills or rather deficiencies as he labels them and the disorders that he sees in infants who later on were diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. So he, he sort of invites you into this rich phenomenological account of how we share a world together. And then he switches from experiences to behaviors when he talks about how children fit into this, children who are later diagnosed, diagnosed with autism fit into this. Um, so ultimately, he defines um, sensory motor deficiencies as located within autistic persons. That's sort of his, his way of explaining the, ch the genuine challenges that persons on the autism spectrum experience in navigating the social world. Right? So he has a different account from the theory of mind deficit view. Um, but the deficiencies, much like the theory of mind deficit view, are located on the side of the individual. Um, so that's obviously problematic if we want to make room for the notion of neurodiversity. Um, and it, it also, I worry, sets up a kind of confirmation bias um, in terms of how we interpret the allegedly deficient sensory motor behaviors of autistic persons. Um, because the, the problem with Gallagher's view, sorry, is that if, right, so I, I'll just read this quote because it's easier than if I <laughs> try to wing it. So my concern, as I, I put it in, in my article, is that an over-assurance in the idea that we will simply and automatically see mindedness expressed in behavior, right, in virtue of these rich shared contexts of significance that we already inhabit together, uh, this sets the stage for a confirmation bias in our explanations of autistic expressions of mind as deficient and pathological. Because if we the perceptual social cognition experts don't directly and effortlessly see mindedness there, it must not be there. So something different happens when you turn to Hannah de Jager's autopoietic and active approach to autism. Instead of starting with the phenomenology of everyday experience, which is a phenomenology derived from neurotypical everyday experience, the Jager starts in a more ontological way from a theory about what it means to be a cognizing agent at all, right? Human or non-human, uh, neurotypical, uh, non-neurotypical, the autopoietic inactive approach to cognition believes that all cognizers are at heart precarious autonomous beings who are in the business of, of, of maintaining who they are through a kind of dependency on uh, their material and social environment. And she emphasizes that in asking about the uh, embodiment of, of others and, and what bodily expressions of others might mean, right, we don't take as the starting point our, the phenomenology of everyday experience we are familiar with, we take as the starting point 
that bodily expressive behavior is always the expressive behavior of a singular autonomous person who experiences their world in a way that's irreducibly meaningful to them. So one way to make this more concrete is perhaps you are familiar with Mel or Amanda Bax's video, In My Language. If you're not, um, I recommend you look it up on YouTube. Um, so if you, if you watch this video where Mel Bags, uh, a, a non-speaking autistic person is showing her viewer there, sorry, showing their viewers um, their preferred way of engaging with their environment. So it's a very bodily um, absorbed way of engaging with inanimate features of their of their world. If you view this video of, of, of Bags's behavior from a kind of Gallagherian outlook, so to speak, and if you if you take as a sort of rock solid the assumption that we will just see mindedness and, 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 and the intentions and desires and beliefs of others as sort of unambiguously expressed in their behaviors, then you will likely interpret the behavior that you see in this video as indicative of some sort of deficiency or pathology. But if you adopt the Yager's autopoietic inactive starting point, you will probably ask very different questions. You will ask what, right, what the meaning might be for this cognizer to engage their environment in this particular way. So it opens up a different perspective. Um, another feature of the Jager's view is that social skills are not just individual skills, that they are the sorts of things that are shaped by what she calls participatory sense making. It's a kind of a, it's a rich theoretical concept that is going to take way too much time to explain and I'm seeing that I'm already two minutes over. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but the main point is that for her, social skills cannot just be reducible to individual actions or intentions, but that they install a relational domain with its own properties that constrains and modulates individual behavior. And so on this view, right, that, that, that how we respond to and perceive other people, if that's broadly a characterization of social skills, on this, on this view where how we perceive and respond to other people is, is also shaped by not just what we as individuals can do, but how the other responds to us, then this creates a kind of relational approach to um, autism relate, related uh, deficits. Right? So from the Yager's point of view, instead of locating deficiency at either a theory of mind deficit level or a sensory motor deficit level, which is what we've just seen, right? We get the idea that there are different forms of embodiment, so to speak, different patterns, rhythms, ways of engaging the environment, ways of keeping one's interactions with the other going or not, right? Ways of holding the other in view that might not fully match. Right, that there are mismatches and moments of breakdown that cannot be fully attributed to each interactor, right? Because of the relational domain within which our actions unfold. So you get a relational approach to the notion of deficits. Finally, if I can take just two more minutes, the one issue that I have with the Yager's approach is that we experience mismatches in our social interactions with other persons all the time. And it might at times motivate us to break off a relationship with a person, right, or a friendship, but it doesn't necessarily compel us to label the other person's behavior as deficient, right? So the Yacher expands our notion of, of, of deficiency and locates it in a relational space but doesn't quite give us the resources for thinking about, okay, but then why have, have we neurotypicals so overwhelmingly placed the efficiency wholly on the side of autistic individuals? 
And I think she cannot really get there because she's not bringing in the wider normative background against which we perceive other people and their behavior. So this is where I think Joel Kruger and Michelle Maez's approach is really helpful. And ironically, they're building off of Sean Gallagher in their approach. Uh, so there's resources within Gallagher's view that he himself doesn't really make use of in understanding autism. And what Kruger and Maeza are emphasizing is that um, our social cognition is often carried by our inhabiting mental institutions. So one example of a mental institution is a university, right? And so when I'm sitting, this is not happening now in COVID times, but when I'm sitting in a lecture hall and I'm looking at my professor, you know, I, I immediately make sense of and perceive their bodily behaviors, um, partly in light of how in light of my understanding of, of what is expected of a person on that stage in a lecture hall. And so here's what they're saying. Many aspects of social understanding are carried by the world, scaffolded by the norms and routines that regulate our embodied interactions and habits of mind. So ways of attending to people, expectations we have of people and, and how we perceive them. Understanding others involves bringing shared norms to bear for our sense of what people generally do and what they can be expected to do is linked to our views about what they ought to do. Right? So our embeddedness in mental institutions set up normative expectations in our perception of others. Right? And th this can be pernicious. Right? And so those who are out of, out of step with the norms dictated by a given mental institution, right, are, are prone to be sidelined or, or labeled as out of step, falling short, deficient. So the diversity deficiency challenge on this account, right, can be explained in terms of, right, the degree to which someone's expressive behavior fits into uh, a mental institution that's taken as normative. Um, and it also offers kind of, it points to areas for mitigating the, the, cha the challenges in areas of social cognition by thinking about how we can make mental institutions more diverse and inclusive. So we have in, in the end three different approaches, the three different 4E approaches to deficiency. In the autism context, we have Gallagher's individualistic approach, focusing on sensory motor abnormalities. We have the Jager's dyadic inter-individual approach, focusing on mismatches in interpersonal interaction, differences in bodily rhythms and, and ways of, of looking at the other, attending to the other, timing and social interaction. And then we have Kruger and Mayas's more triadic approach. Um, my conclusion, my preliminary conclusion, is that Kruger and Maez's account best um, captures the normative evaluation of autistic expressions as deficient, while also offering resources for how to mitigate this, and that the Jager's account is important um, because of its emphasis on the autonomous, precarious perspective of the cognizer, which can help us question the sometimes unquestioned standing of neurotypical mental institutions. And finally, as I already said, the, the main takeaway, I believe, is that seemingly subtle differences in one's theoretical starting point have a big ethical impact in terms of how we bring in view the minds of others. I believe that's it. Thank you for listening, and if we have time, which we don't, <laughs> Let's talk AAC tech. Okay, thank you, Jana, um, for this.